Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Catch the Fire. If you are visiting us, if you're a newcomer, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We're glad all of you are here that we get to worship together this morning. Um, if you are ready to stand to your feet, you can stand up right away. We're going to get started. We have baptisms this morning. Yeah! We do this a few times a year. Um, and so we believe in the power of baptism. It's more than just a ceremonial act or a symbolic act, which it are those things, but we actually believe in the, the prophetic act of baptism in the Bible. When you see um, people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they were always immediately baptized right after. And if you read in, um, even when Jesus was baptized, but in the book of Acts, the new church and the new Christians, power was always associated with baptism. The Holy Spirit came on Jesus. The new Christians, they gave their lives to Jesus. They were baptized and power came and they were prophesying and speaking in tongues. And so um, we believe in the prophetic act and the power that comes on us when we get baptized. And so we are gonna baptize a few people this morning. And um, I wanna encourage you that when we're watching, I love it when we all cheer, I love it. As a community and as a family and a church family, we're cheering for our brothers and sisters in Christ, making a public declaration of their faith in Jesus through baptism. Also, what you can pray is when they come up out of the water, if you wanna stretch your hands and just under your breath say, Holy Spirit, bring your power on them, you can do that too. And that's what um, the, uh, the ministers doing the baptisms are always praying. So you can pray for the Holy Spirit and the power to be released over these people being baptized. Also, if you're here this morning and you're thinking, I've never been baptized, you are welcome to come up. We have a team here and say, I wanna be baptized this morning. But also, you can also let us know, and we do these a few times a year, and so you can sign up for the next baptism as well. Awesome. Well, you're welcome to come up to the front. Um, for those of you who are a newcomer, we start with worship. We do have baptisms this morning, and then there's a, a speaking and, and the word afterwards. Um, but in worship, we do like to physically express ourselves. And so if you if you want space or anything like that, find your space. I find personally when I come to the front, I am least the least distracted. Um, and so you're welcome to come up to the front, and we're going to worship Jesus. So I just want to invite everyone that's getting baptized this morning to come up here to the front. Awesome. Welcome. Come right up. Come right up over here. We want to introduce you. Great. Great. So before you come right in, wait, wait one second. I'm going to ask you to sh tell everyone your name, okay? Your name. Van Vanessa. Vanessa. Mark. Mark. Columbus. Manny. Natasha. Natasha. And Denise. Lee. Denise. Lee. Lee. Awesome. Welcome, guys. We are so excited for you this morning. This is a big day for you, a powerful day for you, and we pray that the Holy Spirit comes on you as you uh, make this significant declaration of your faith this morning in baptism. And I just wanna ask you, are you excited, ready and excited to declare your faith in Jesus publicly this morning? Yes, awesome. All right, well, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We're here for you this morning as we're celebrating with our new brothers and sisters in Christ. We just want to give you all the glory and praise and say, Jesus, we are here because of you. You saved us. You found us. You hunted us down and you wrestled us with your love and we're here for you. And so we can't help but come before you and say thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. And we give you praise, the highest praise. And we want to worship you this morning with everything we have. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
stand be on the end before beginning eternal one creator god you made the world and it was good all in all self-sufficient so high above but never distant made for your love fashioned from dust you gave us breath and it was good all the glory and honor blessing and power because your name alone is worthy worthy forever the praise is yours
dressing in pal Because your name alone is worthy Worthy forever The praise is yours One more time, let's sing out our glory It's all the glory and honor Blessing and power Because your name alone is worthy Worthy forever The praise is yours Praise you, Jesus Love you, Lord Praise you, God Praise you, Jesus Praise you, Father I am an instrument of exaltation I was born to lift your name above all names You hear the melody of all creation But there's a song of praise that only I can who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. You are. You chose to make my heart a dwelling place You heal my brokenness Show me your glory So I have songs of thanks Not even angels sing Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy?
and who else? And who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There's no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus.
chose a road that led to suffering nothing was spared to prove your love for me all the mystery that your final breath became eternity what we had lost for
just praise you this morning. I just felt like this morning, can we just all shout a, just to praise God, just to thank Him. We're here this morning. Let's just release our voice, release it, God. We praise you. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. We thank you. We thank you. Hallelujah. We give you the glory and the honor this morning. We thank you. We thank you. You're good. You're good. Yeah. This morning, I just kept hearing God say, God, He is love. He is love. What have we, what have we been singing this morning? He is good. He is faithful. So this morning, if that's you, if you're feeling like, I, I don't feel it, I've been, I've been hitting a wall with God, or there's just been um, just a block, I've, I've really felt this morning, as just all of us, we can just release that through our voice. We can release um, just praise and thankfulness. So this morning, if that's you, I'm gonna encourage you to just release a shout, release a, just a praise, a dedication. Um, I got a, a, a picture this morning of the story of where the woman um, breaks perfume over Jesus' feet. And in that moment, the people around were judging and you know they were like, how wasteful is that? And as God is reminding me of this story, she knew what was important in that moment. Even when those around her might think it's foolish of her or it might be wasteful. If right now you feel like this is all I got, God, I just encourage you to give what you have. Give what you have this morning. Even if it feels wasteful, even if it feels like it's not worthy of God, He is worthy. I'm telling you this morning, we've been singing it all morning, He is worthy. And this morning, this is an act of declaration on your part to reciprocate that love, to give it back. Yeah, so I'm just gonna invite the worship team <laughs> to just lead us again. And as they just lead us back into worship, guys, I'm encouraging, go for it. Leave nothing back, hold nothing back this morning. If you're scared of holding, you know, looking foolish this morning, if you are scared of what your friend next to you will think or the person in front of you, behind you, who cares? This morning, fix your eyes on who is worthy. Who is worthy? Who is worthy of your breath this morning? Who is worthy of your praise this morning? Who is worthy? Give it all, give it all. Oh, that means you need to come to the front. I welcome you, come to the front. Get on your face, get on your knees.
of freedom. This is a morning of freedom. Ha, and if you need freedom this morning, yeah. Stretch out your hands. We're just gonna, yeah. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for every single one of your children in this house this morning. God, I thank you that this morning you are releasing your joy. You're releasing freedom over this house. Yeah. Any disappointment that's been carried over from the week, God, right now, I just see um, ministering angels coming around and lifting off these stacks off of you. So if you need to do that, if we need to do that, um, just as a congregation, lift that off of you. If there's heaviness, if there's sadness, lay them, lay them down at his feet. This morning, we just release Holy Spirit to minister to every single one of you that is in need of freedom this morning. Yeah, Whew. yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if where we believe right now that God is in this house, God is in this room, God is right next to you and God is in you, there is freedom. There is freedom. So I just release freedom, freedom. And if that means you need to breathe out, let's breathe out, let's breathe out the, the anything that you've been carrying on. Breathe in and breathe it out. We breathe in your, your freedom, Lord. We breathe in your freedom. and ministering to our hearts. And I just felt as Tammy was ministering freedom, I don't know if there's anyone here that's felt like there's a ceiling over them or a wall and you keep hitting up against that wall, but you know you've had prophetic words about that wall being broken through. And I feel like that what Tammy was ministering to more this more, um, just now, this is for you this morning. If you feel like I don't know, there's a lid on you or whatever it is, a, a ceiling, like a glass ceiling. I just want you to like raise your hands right now and almost like break through it because there's breakthrough for you this morning. In this house, there is breakthrough for you this morning. You have access to it this morning. God is saying, it is yours, it is yours, it is yours. And by faith, you punch that wall, you punch that ceiling, whatever that lid is that's holding you down, that's stopping you, that's blocking you. God is saying there is breakthrough this morning for you. And by f <laughs> oh, God, you so love us. You so love us. Thank you, God, that your word says that it's while we were sinners, while we were in darkness, while we were called enemies of God, a strong word, you came down, you plucked us out of the darkness, you put us into light, into the into your kingdom, and you said, and you said, you you were my children. Sin separated you from relationship with me, but God came and made a way. And the and the word says, the Bible says, God says, I'm adopting you back. Adoption is a high price. We know that in today, if you want to adopt, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And God said, I have paid the price for your adoption to come back into my family as my my son and my daughter God created you because he wanted you in his family and sin separated you from relationship with him he's a holy God he's a perfect God and to be in unity with him to be connected to him requires us to be in righteousness and sin and sin separated us and there's only one way 
back into that relationship with God and that is Jesus. There's no other way. It's a narrow way, um, but it, it actually requires something so simple, powerful but simple, and that is your faith. That is you declaring that actually it is by Jesus that I can now come back into relationship with God. And I think, you know, over, you know, we, we think of salvation as like my ticket to heaven once I'm done here, you know, once my years, my decades here on earth is gone, okay, now I'm gonna do it at the very end, you know, but this is what salvation is. It's saying yes to Jesus so that I can be in relationship with him again. And it's not for when, you, when our time here on earth is done, but it's actually for right now. You and I were designed to be in relationship with him and with Without that relationship with God, something is severely missing in your life. Whether you know it or not, your subconscious knows it. There's an emptiness, there's a void. And that's because you were designed to have relationship with Him. The only way to have that is your confession um, and your declaration of you believing Jesus, the work of the cross. Jesus basically said, I'm going to purchase them back to him and that purchase is his life it's a perfect life paying the price of our sin which is death so jesus said i'll take the death of myself he put himself on death row to take us off of death row and all we have to do is say yes jesus i believe and we all in our lives have to do that at some point in our lives and so every sunday we do this together and we're going to do it again now and we're going to confess our faith in jesus and if you've been doing this for years and years and years you know what it's beautiful to confess our faith all the time and to remind ourselves what he's done but I want to encourage you guys just to stand up for a little bit longer we're gonna sit down in a few minutes um, and we're gonna confess our faith in Jesus yes all right so you can repeat after me Jesus thank you that you paid the price for my sin and that price was death but you died in my place so that I can have relationship with God, that I can come before God, that God can dwell inside of me, that God can dwell with me, and I recognize I need Him. I need Him. I can't do life without Him. I can't save myself. There's nothing I can do to make myself righteous. So this morning I say, yes, Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Deep breath, thank you, thank you. The Bible says that when you've just done this, he's come and resided inside of you and he says, yes, yes. You have been justified by your faith, by this declaration. If you are here this morning and this is the first time you've prayed this, or maybe you've prayed this before, maybe in your childhood or in your youth, you've walked away and you've come this morning and you've just said, oh my goodness, I need him. I can't do this without him. If you are here this morning and you've just given your life to Jesus, can you be brave and bold and wave your hand to, to us. And the reason why we're asking you to let us know who you are, because we wanna make sure you don't walk out these doors, go home, sit in your car, go back to home and be like, what just happened, was that real? But we wanna celebrate with you, we wanna welcome you. You are now in the family of God. You've been adopted back in, and that means you're our brother and sister. <laughs> you're in the family of God. If that is you this morning, hey Mel, I just gave my life to Jesus. Can you wave your hand and, and Awesome, hand, we got hands, all right, awesome. Well, guys, can I just tell you, this is the most important day of your life. And this doesn't mean your life is gonna be perfect. It doesn't mean that everything is gonna sort itself out, but it does mean now that you have access to the creator of the universe, to your creator, you have access to have relationship with him. He is with you. He's with you. All right, one last bold step, because I saw those hands waving. Can you come out out of your seats, come to the front? We're all still standing here, and we have a team here on the side, happy, joyful, loving people that actually just want to say congratulations, and we want to pray for you. We want to pray that the Holy Spirit comes on you in a way that you can tangibly feel. We want to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
So if that's you, will you come up? And if you're a little bit nervous, ask the person who's beside you, the person you came with, uh, come, come with me and you can come up. So if that's you, you can come up right now. This team is here waiting for you. Awesome. All right, I saw those hands. I saw those hands. <laughs> awesome, so good. And if someone's come with them, you can join. Join your friend, join your family member. I think that is an amazing thing to do. Walk up with them. Awesome. So good. I just wanna give you one more minute. If you're sitting here in your seat, you're feeling something, either you feel emotional, your heart's beating, you prayed that prayer, you know that this was significant for you, can we please pray for you? We really wanna pray for you. We wanna bless you, we wanna encourage you, we wanna welcome you. We've all had to do this at some point in our lives. All right. Awesome. At any point this morning, you're welcome to come on up as well throughout the rest of the meeting, after, after the meeting today as well. Let us know. We want to we wanna welcome you, and we actually want you to feel like you're a part of our family here at Catch the Fire in Toronto. So awesome. Great. All right, all right, well, some of you are already sitting, but can you say hi to a few people? Three people, three people, hi, how are you? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tammy, and this is Mel. <laughs> um, this morning, we just want to welcome you, welcome you to Catch the Fire. If you are new here, welcome. Um, we just wanted to go into a segue. We are a church that believes in tithing and giving God back what is his. Um, and this morning, actually, Murray, our senior leader, is going to be speaking on this. So I just wanted to encourage you guys, if you look on the screen, you can see the different ways of giving. Um, and you can give away that way. Um, yeah, I'll give it to Mel. Yeah, awesome. You know what, this morning, it's, it was an amazing message. So my prayer is that uh, Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts, open our hearts. Um, and yeah, we wanna hear from you in the, in when, we t when we talk about our, uh, about our giving. So Holy Spirit, have our hearts ready for the message this morning. <laughs> All right, so we have one announcement, um, and that is, who here has ever been to Fresh Wind? Put your hands up. Yeah, okay, if you don't know, Fresh Wind is our annual youth conference. So teenagers from our, our home church here, but from, all, from everywhere, come once a year on our Easter long weekend in April. Actually, it's March this year, isn't it? Um, and so it is, guys, hundreds of teenagers pack out in this place, and it is awesome, it's epic. And you're, you're actually all invited. If you feel like I need some youth in my life, come to the conference. Um, and so it is, it is so good. It is powerful and it's a big highlight of our year and our teams behind the scenes are like buzzing you know when we plan it and we and we're here so it's going to be awesome we have a promo video for it that we want to show you and then murray i'll invite you up to come up after Nothing makes sense. Things get complicated. What do I believe? Where do I place my hope? Where do I place my hope? What's real? What's true? What's true? What actually matters? I feel all alone. I feel afraid. I feel confused. What do I choose? But through the chaos and confusion, there is a way. There is hope. But our hope is vain without faith. Our faith in Him. We walk by faith. There is hope. In Him. We can do all things through Him. We boldly run the race. To see Him change reality. See Him stretch reality. 
reality. See like he sees. See the impossible. Come on. Amazing. I love that video. Uh, what a great opportunity for our youth to get transformed, to experience and encounter God, and just get radically revolutionized. So I want to encourage you, if you have a, a youth, uh, to pay for them to come. That would be great. I want to say a, a really big thank you to the team that put that together. It's actually a team of, uh, of volunteers, especially Ilya. Where's Ilya? <laughs> Ilya, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, but everybody that was involved in that, that was, that was so good, that, that video. All right, well, good afternoon, church family. It's good to see you all. I uh, have the pleasure of just going on with our sermon series on worship. We've been, uh, off, but other than last week where we stopped and prayed, we've been in this sermon series now. This is our fourth week. And um, we're talking about what is worship, particularly looking at worship, the idea that worship is more than just singing, actually, biblically speaking, worship is obedience, obedience to God, obedience to his word, uh, obedience to his prompting, and it's also worship is dependence, that we depend on him for everything. That's an act of worship for him. And uh, two weeks ago now, Mel preached a great message uh, around um, offering up our bodies as, as living sacrifices, Romans uh, 12, and this being our spiritual act of worship. And so this morning, I want to take that idea on a little further into um, worship, our generosity or our giving being worship. You know, part of that merging of obedience and um, dependence upon him. So we're going to look at, start by looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. I'm going to sort of dot through a few scriptures uh, here and there. And uh, we're going to start with Matthew 6, 24. We're talking about worship. We're talking about our attitudes towards our possessions and our giving. So Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or actually in the Greek, that's mammon, uh, which is really a, a personification of our possessions, our wealth, which includes our finances. It also includes our time, our energy, our uh, other possessions like houses and land and things that we have from God. Now, we believe as Christians that everything that we have comes from God. He's a good father. He, we haven't just landed upon things by accident. He's actually orchestrated things in our lives and every good thing that we have in our lives has come from him. But what Jesus here is saying is we can't live with a foot in the camp of materialism and our desire to hold on to our possessions and live in the camp of loving and believing in God. It's either or. You can't serve your possessions or you can't uh, and, and try and serve God at the same time. It's, it's either or. You can't have two masters. And that word uh, for serve actually is kind of like um, indentured servant or, or, or that you are a sort of a slave to what you do. So if you worship your possessions, if you're devoted to the things that you have, your stuff, your job, your house, your car, your bank account, your time, your energy, your relationships, if you're devoted to those things, you will serve those things. It's an element that you actually they will have control over you and you can't do anything but follow your desires and in serving those things. Where, as God's, what Jesus is saying, the better way is to serve the Father. It's to serve him and to be generous towards him and to give him your allegiance and your love and then he will lead you and he will guide you. The best antidote for the materialism that we see in our lives for the things that we struggle with in terms of our own possessions and our desire to accumulate wealth, the very best antidote to all of that is generosity. It is an act of worship 
It's something that we are willing, when we are willing to give away our possessions, the things that we hold, that we have, that we've received, when we're willing to give those away, it's actually offering up our bodies as living sacrifices and we're giving God his worship, the worship that's due his name. And so we can, we're gonna talk a little bit about generosity, generosity today. And when we're talking about generosity in our worship, we're talking obviously more than just finances. We have many different resources. We have one of our, actually probably our most valuable resource is our time. We, have, we don't have very much of it. I don't know if you know, but it, the clock is still ticking. We have our energy that we have as a resource. We have our possessions as a resource, we, which is you know, our bank accounts, our, our food, our uh, families. We have our cars and our stuff that we have. We also have the ability, we have our heart and the ability to be generous or to be stingy with our relationships and the way that we either open ourselves up to other people or close ourselves off. When we're, when we're talking about offering up our lives as worship and then generosity being that act of worship, it's way more than just giving money to a particular worthy cause. It's actually about opening ourselves up to all that God has for us and opening up ourselves to other people. In fact, Jesus said the mark of a disciple, the mark of a follower of Jesus, the mark of someone who's looking to pattern their life after Jesus is their openness of a heart to other people, is their ability to love, not just love people like them, but love their enemies, just like God loved us. Man, I found that a challenge. As I've been thinking and preparing about this, you know, it's easy to think, yeah, I can offer up my body as living sacrifice. But when it starts to come to our time and our energy and our relationships and our wallets, it becomes way more rubber hits the road. And it's, the interesting thing is Jesus, he had a lot to say about giving. He had a lot to say about how we handle our finances how we relate to our possessions, including our money and the things that we've got, actually reveals a lot about our hearts to God and our worship. Are we worshiping our possessions and holding on to them and therefore serving our job, serving our money, serving our family, or are we actually, you know, in an unhealthy way, or are we actually releasing, being open-handed to God and giving him all that he's, you know, giving back to him all that he's given us? So there's three things I wanna cover this morning specifics around giving. The first one relates more specifically to finances and the other two are gonna relate more generally to the possessions and the things that we have. And uh, the first one is gonna, is we're gonna talk a little bit about returning our tithe and I wanna put the idea of the first fruits in that together. The second one is uh, sowing a seed. The third one is giving. And right from the outset, I wanna to say to you, to you as a church family, thank you for your incredible generosity. Thank you for the way that you are sowing your finances in and giving, you know, returning your tithes if you're doing so, if you're giving offerings, it, thank you for doing that. Thank you for those of you that give your time to serve on a team, uh, be it on a Sunday morning or other times where you serve by leading a connect group or even joining a connect group. Thank you to all of you that actually um, lead a group or uh, lead a connect group and you're opening up your hearts, whether you lead or whether you're just part of it, you're opening up your hearts, you're praying for, you're loving, you're being with other people in this community. This is an incredibly generous community. So I'm not here to say do better, I'm here to say well done and keep going, All right? So the first thing I wanna cover is that, uh, returning our tithes and first fruits. And this, for me, this is really about, I, I'm kind of combining two principles uh, in the Old Testament that God uh, instructed his people, the ancient Israelites. The first one is um, the idea of first fruits. What's a first fruit? It's literally that. It's the first thing that you have, giving it to God. We first see this in, uh, actually in Genesis chapter four, where there's two brothers, and uh, they give an offering to God. Interesting, an offering can never be taken, an offering can only ever be given. And so they give an offering to God, and Abel, he's the one that he offers of the first things that he's got, the things that God's given him, those very first things he offers back to the Lord 
Whereas Cain, his brother, he like waits to see what he's got and then kind of offers something back to the Lord. And God commands Abel because he gave him the very first thing. It's an act of faith. It's like, what I've got, I'm giving back to you in the anticipation that there's more coming. So there's an idea of first fruits, then the Israelites have commanded to, 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 to take that on. The second element is this idea of returning the tithe, which was to take 10% of all the increase of all the things that God had given the Israelites and to give it to the Levites and the temple system so that, so that those who were charged with taking care of the corporate worship and the, the temple, they could be fed and they could be looked after and, and there's joy and celebration within that as well. And so... You know, because I'm not an agriculturalist and I don't have fruit to give or wheat to give the Lord, I just like to combine those two things together and say that actually for us, the practice of returning our first fruits is linked to our tithe. For Ash and I, that means as soon as we get any money, we give 10% of it to the, to, to the storehouse that God's given us, which is not a law, but a joy to be discovered. It's an act of obedience and an act of dependence. First of all, it's obedience to say, Lord, this is my offering back to you. I'm giving you, what you a portion of what you've given me in accordance with what I believe Scripture teaches. And then there's an act of dependence that says, my very first that I have, and I'm not waiting till the very end to see how it turns out. The very first thing I have, I'm offering it back to you as an act of dependence to say, I'm expecting you to fill it up and to, be, to give me more. A couple of scriptures to, to, to back this up. So Proverbs chapter three, verse nine and 10, it says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your produce, or produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. God's invitation to us is to say, if you honor me, if you are dependent upon me, if you're obedient to me, if you honor me with your wealth and honor me with your first fruits, then I'm gonna pour blessing back upon you. I didn't say that. This is God's word, right? Some people get a little bent out of shape where you're just saying give to get. Well, we're not talking about that. But God's promise clearly is that if you give, you shall receive whatever that looks like in many multiple ways, and we'll come back to that in a minute. The second scripture I want to look at is Malachi 3, verse 10 and 11. Jesus is saying, sorry, that God is saying to the ancient Israelites, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, to bear, to bear says the Lord of hosts. It's a very clear principle that if you, you, you can't outgive God essentially, if you are faithful to return a recognition that everything that I have is from the Lord and so I'm gonna offer back to you 10% of the very best that I have, the first that I have, then God is gonna pour out his blessing upon you. Now, some people will say, well, this is an Old Testament paradigm and it's an Old Testament scripture and, and it is true, but Jesus himself in Matthew 23, he, he commends, he affirms tithing as something that you should do while not neglecting justice and righteousness and the other things, right? Actually, if you wanna be really technical, Tithing is a, 10% is a really good deal because if you look at the, the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost, they actually, the word says that they had everything in common and they didn't hold anything themselves. In other words, they gave 100%. So I think 10% is probably a good deal. Mel used the analogy earlier in the first service about a franchise. You know, if you have a franchise, you, uh, the, 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 the uh, system and the, the, the business is owned by someone else, but you take on that and then you get the return and you give back to um, the franchise organization. And so 10% is a pretty good deal. God's desire, God's ideal is that he's gonna open the windows of blessing and it may not be money, but it may be more uh, other elements of wealth that come through in terms of relationships, in terms of ideas, in terms of health, other elements that God wants to prosper us and bless us in. 
So we joyfully practice that. Something that Ash and I have sought to do over our, over our years, and this isn't, I'm not saying this to sort of toot our own horn, but just to say when we, we've experienced the blessing, we've experienced the joy, and we seek to practice that the very first 10% that comes in of everything that we, uh, we earn, we give it back to the Lord. And uh, it's a joy and a, de and a delight. So my question here right now is, how is your obedience and how is your dependence? Are you practicing the idea of first fruits? And are, are you giving the Lord from your very best or are you waiting to see what you've got left over and then give him sloppy seconds? The other idea is, are you, you know, returning your tithe? Are you, have you got that revelation? Have you discovered that it's a joy to be to be able to do that. And this is not a heavy word, this is not condemnation, it's not law, it's just an invitation for blessing from the, from the Father. It says of, um, in the New Testament, when, they, when the disciples, early, in the early uh, moments, days after Pentecost, the disciples, they gave money, they sold land, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. So one of the principles that Ash and I have taken out of this scripture is that we like to return our tithe to the local storehouse, which we believe is the church, that we return our tithe to the church because the church that we're part of is the source of the blessing that we're receiving, so we're returning it back. I know for some people, they like to give their tithe across multiple different places, but for Ash and I, our practice is that we're returning it in full to this local church, so we love to do that. We're not just practice, we're not just telling you what to do, we wanna practice what God's put in our own hearts. We also, as a church, you may not be aware of this, but we as a church apply this principle. So 10% of everything that we own, we get, I should say, from, we receive as tithes and offerings, we actually sow into our uh, umbrella organization, Catch the Fire World, for the purpose of the global reach of the kingdom of God and Catch the Fire's ministry all over the world. So we give as a church 10% every month and the first thing that we do is put it aside so that we have money to be able to, to, be able to return that tithe. So we lay it at the apostles' feet. We're not expecting a return but we're believing God to take him at his word. How is your obedience with returning your tithe and doing the principle of the first fruits? The second element, and this is much broader than possessions, uh, so, sorry, the finances is the idea of sowing a seed. And as I was thinking about it, it's like you sow a seed and you get a snowball of blessing. It accumulates and it grows. So uh, one, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to look at that very briefly. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 11. Paul's writing, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's an idea that Jesus himself said earlier. He said, you know, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken down, pressed over and over, you know, pressed together and overflowing. And he goes on to say this, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, don't do it because it's arm twisting. Do it because you've got joy in your heart as an act of worship back to him. And that word uh, cheerful could be like hilarious. It's with great joy and delight. It should be the most exciting, joy-filled moment of our lives to be able to sow an offering. And then he goes on to say in verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. In other words, you've got all sufficiency. God gives you everything that you need. In all things, in every situation that you need it, and at all times, in every time that you need it, God's gonna supply so that you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So sowing a seed is going over and above what we're giving in terms of returning our tithes and, and doing, practicing the idea of first fruits. And it is, applies to many different dimensions of our lives. 
Sometimes we can't sow a seed of finances, but what we can do is sow a seed in another area of our lives. So for Ash and I, sowing a seed is some, has meant having different people live with us over, over our 30 years of marriage. I think we've had something like 25 different people living with us because there's been a need that we wanted to meet and we've been therefore thinking, okay, if we invest in them, it will bear fruit in their lives and we're sowing a seed into their lives. It might be sowing a seed in relationship. It might be someone that you, that you know that you've got uh, a little bit of connection with. You see them and you're like, I see there's something of God in them. I'm gonna sow a seed into them by investing relationally into them and by put, you know, giving something of my heart and, um, and seeing what God does. But it's really clear in this context, it actually is just talking also about sowing seeds of finances and, and generosity. I was thinking about my grandfather, William Smith. So somebody, Pablo, came up to me and he said, hey, I didn't realize you were related to Will Smith. You can tell by my skin color, right? Yeah, that's exactly. William Smith, called Mr. Bill. And um, my grandfather uh, in England, born in the early 1900s, his mother was a, uh, a widow. He, uh, his dad died two days before he was born or a week before he was born. And his grandmother had also been a widow, but they were great Baptist people. Shout out for the Baptists, right? And, um, and so my grandfather, he, he started farming and uh, he wasn't able to go to war because he, in World War II because he was a farmer and needed at home. Um, so he, he farmed and the Lord, he, you know, he began to practice these principles and the Lord brought blessing into his life. And so he started a dairy uh, a manufacturer uh, of, you know, we had, they had cows, so this natural thing to start a dairy. They had, um, uh, you know, cheese, uh, not, not cheese, sorry, milk and cream and yogurt that they were producing. And, and at one point they served, the dairy grew and because of the blessing of the Lord, they served a large portion of the southeast of, of England. And my, my granddad sowed a lot of seeds and I believe we saw a snowball effect of the blessing as he sowed his seeds. Chatting with my dad yesterday, so, you know, he, he was, as I said, a good Baptist. He went to this, him and uh, my grandmother went to this church called Abbey Baptist Church in, uh, in Oxfordshire, a place called Abingdon. And uh, my grandfather sowed seeds by um, helping finance a lot of, giving a lot of money to the Baptist mission. It was called Grace Baptist Mission, to, particularly to missionaries that were in India. But not only that, he actually was able to buy houses in England for the people that were in the headquarters of the Baptist mission. He, met, uh, um, uh, he went to a meeting once and met a, a pastor from Nagaland in the northwest corner of India where there was a, a revival that was going on. It was one of the main states in, in uh, India that's still predominantly Christian as I understand. And there was this revival that was going on with this gentleman, a pastor called Pastor Chupa, and uh, my grandfather sowed into his ministry and actually started to, or helped to fund a Bible missions training school in Nagaland. Um, he, through some foundations that he established, still to this day there's seeds being sown into church plants, into an orphanage in Africa and, and various other places. Uh, he sowed into church planting, he sowed into missions. And when I was young, we were living in Nigeria as missionaries, so my, I guess my granddad also sowed my mum and dad as missionaries. They, um, we lived, we came back to England for a short season and we lived in this really, really amazing, massive mansion. And I asked my dad, what was that? And my dad said, well, that was my granddad who bought that building with the intention, and he did, actually turn it into an aged care facility to look after people uh, in their old age. He was an incredible See, sower of seeds and he was incredibly blessed by the Lord. Bringing it a little closer to this church family, I don't know if you know, but we are mortgage free on this building, which is wonderful. And that's through the generosity of somebody that I don't think we know who it is. But a few years ago, Steve was preaching on this principle of, of sowing a seed and, and receiving a harvest, and we'll look at the, the harvest in just a minute. In fact, you know, there's two, well, let's do it now. There's two scriptures that Jesus talks about, Matthew 13, where he's talking about the parable of the sower, and it's the good seed will produce a harvest of 30, 60, and 100-fold. 
And then in Mark chapter uh, 10, verse 29 and 30, he's also talking about, you know, nobody that's left land and buildings and houses and brothers and sisters and mother and father, that not you know, for the sake of Jesus and the gospel is gonna return, gonna return a hundredfold. Now, he doesn't use the word sowing a seed, but that's basically what he's talking about. And so Steve was talking about this a few years ago, and there was somebody, a couple in this church who, who said, you know what, God, I'm gonna take you at your word. I'm gonna give it a go. And if you bless me, I'm gonna sow a seed of one one hundredth, and if you bless me and bring that one hundredth fold return back, I'm gonna pay off the church's mortgage. God says, test me in this. I think he likes to be tested. He's like, oh, you wanna depend on me? Fantastic. I will show you how big and strong I am. And so, sure enough, the hundredfold return came in. Think about it. A million dollars. That's a lot of money. God bless them. They were faithful in that. And if you're here today, thank you so much. You're sowing a seed. Sowing a seed to receive well, A, because you're moved, but B, God then says, I wanna pour a blessing back into your lap. So when we sow a seed, one of the things that Ash and I love to do as we've sowed seeds over the year is to call it back in. It's to say, Lord, you promised by your word that when we sow a seed, you will return that upon us and you will increase our seed and bring us a harvest of righteousness for the all glory, which is what we just read in 2 Corinthians. So we call that seed in. We stand on the word of God. We stand in faith and we say, Lord, let that blessing come. And we wait patiently and we believe God for it. We don't let discouragement come in. So thinking about this, right? So this idea that when we, when we sow a seed, in fact, thinking about, you know, some friends of ours are church planting and, and we were talking about this with them and they're believing God for a building and so one of the things that they did is they had some money and they, they, they sowed a seed into another church plant in the city into their building fund to bless that church plant so that on the, on the belief that God would actually bless them and they would be able to call it back. It's a hundredfold return. But as I think about this, I think there's probably in that hundredfold return three, at least three dimensions. There's first a personal dimension where God pours back blessing into us when we sow a seed and we believe God for a return. There's a personal blessing. Certainly my grandfather was able to live in the good of that reality. But thinking about my grandfather, I realized there's another level of the seed and that level of a hundredfold return is actually generational because the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And so Ash and I, as my grandfather's children's children, are walking in the blessing and the inheritance of, of his faithful stewardship. And of course, what we're trying to do is as we receive and walk in that blessing is to be faithful stewards so that our children's children will also walk in that blessing. And so there's a generational blessing that I believe that goes on beyond our lives through our generations. It's a hundredfold return that God wants to pour back into us. But again, thinking about my grandfather, I believe there's also in this hundredfold return the idea of a spiritual or even a geographic return. Because I think about all the missionaries that my grandfather funded, you know, was able to sow seeds into. I think about the training school in Nagaland and I think about all the other, other things that have gone on uh, in Africa and other places that they've continued to sow seeds into. And I think what an incredible hundredfold harvest that's now not just focused on one individual, but has now gone across the world and brought spiritual blessing across very, very many people. Maybe it hasn't been a hundredfold specifically you know, for, for, for an individual, but God has used it to grow and to bring great fruit across the world. Man, I wanna be like my granddad. Come on. So that's sowing a seed and, and calling it back and just believing God. The third thing that we're called to do is to give. So Matthew chapter five, verse 42. I find this one challenging too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Actually, if we had time, there'd be a fourth one, which would be lending, but we're not gonna have time. But 
Give to the one who begs from you. Chatting with my, grand, my dad yesterday about my grandfather, and what I found was he was living in generational blessing himself. So my great, great, great grandmother, so my grandfather's great grandmother, I lose the greats, but there's a few generations back. She wasn't very wealthy. She was a widow herself. She uh, worked for a very rich family that had a very large country estate, and she, was, she washed all their clothes and their linen and all of that kind of stuff. That's what she did. She wasn't very wealthy. But she would walk to work across the fields and go to church walking across the fields, and she would keep a penny in her pocket so that when... If, if she was to meet someone that was in need, particularly someone that was homeless or just struggling with life, she had something to be able to give them in response to this call from Jesus to give to the one who begs. My grandfather, just humor me for another minute, I just love this story. So, you know, as I said, he wasn't able to go to, go to war, um, but at the end of the war, he was driving along a highway in a, you know, like a country road, and um, he sees this man dressed in soldier's uniform and he was going to debrief at this central place. And so my, my granddad picked him up and took him down there and um, ended up giving him a job. He had uh, my granddad, you know, back in those days, if you had a dairy, you got the little bottles of milk and you'd have them delivered to your doorstep every, you know, so you had a milkman, a milk delivery system. And so my granddad gave this soldier, this veteran, a, a, a job delivering milk. The only problem was that he had a slight problem with alcohol, as I understand it, and he actually, they, you know, some of his customers would put out some whiskey or gin or something to say thank you at Christmas, and one day he just had a little too much, and he ended up getting caught by the police for drink driving. He's driving in a, uh, you know, an electric milk cart, you know, the original Tesla, very slow, like a brick, <laughs> driving an electric milk cart drunk, so he lost his license. So many of us would be like, ah, oh, you're an idiot, but not my granddad. So what my granddad did, and this actually made national news in England for a little while, what he did is he took the milk cart and re-engineered it, took the battery out, and put um, a, uh, like a, a horse saddle connection to it, whatever it's called, right? But basically, he turned the electric milk cart into a horse float, a horse and buggy and strapped a horse to the front so that the guy who had lost his job because he lost his license because of drink driving, guess what? There's no license to drive a horse, <laughs> right? So he straps, the horse, he straps the horse to the electric milk cart and he goes around delivering the, the, the milk perfectly legally because he's riding a horse. I'm like, come on, that's so amazing. What a heart of generosity to give. You know, as I was thinking about it myself, sometimes I don't want to give, you know, particularly if I see someone, maybe they're on the street, you know, I pull up at, a, at, a, at a, um, an intersection and there's someone looking for money and they've got a sign and, and sometimes I, I look at them and, and you know, in my, in my human judgment, I can look at them and go, oh, I don't know if I should give them any money. I'm not sure what's gonna, what they're going to do with the money, right? Ever, anyone ever experienced that? And, um, and so like, there's a reticence to give, and I don't always carry, very rarely carry cash, actually, and we need to probably do that more after thinking about this message. But you know, I, it, sometimes you can kind of just think, oh, I don't wanna do that. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and challenging me a little while ago to say that actually the money in your pocket can be an instrument and a seed of righteousness. It's a soldier for the purposes of kingdom of God. And so when, I, when we give, uh, we're, and we, that happened again yesterday, you know, we just give a little money and we're saying, you know, as before we give it, we're like, okay, money, this be a, an instrument of God's righteousness in your hand. We're gonna give. Lord, may you bless that person. May you prosper them. May this money cause a shift and a turnaround in their lives, right? And so I remember uh, preaching at a, another place once and, and somebody at the end of it came up and just, handed me an envelope and I had a quick look in there and there's 100 US dollars and I'm like, oh, that's great. And I, I forgot about it, put it in the envelope and put it in the glove compartment of the car. One morning I'm just, uh, I'm in the shower and I just have this vision of this one guy that I know stand, who stands on the very corner that we go often through and I have this vision of me giving him this envelope. So, like, okay, great. So I, that morning I'm driving, I, I, I pull up, and then, of course, there he is right there. So I reach into the glove compartment, take out the envelope, 
doesn't know what's inside, and hand it to him, the lights go green and off I go. And as I look in my rear view mirror, he's like, woo! You know, it's like a hundred, he just realized he's getting given a hundred dollars. But I'm praying, Lord, let that be an instrument of righteousness. Turns out one of our other friends who lived on the same, drove past that same intersection every time, also befriended him. We became friends with him. He was called Bernard. And we, uh, she gave him, started giving him odd jobs around the house. Mow the lawn, take care of things. And his life, you know, I'd see him, I'd drive him to his house. He, he lived in a, like a, a, boarding, a boarding house. And we would just, you know, drive him around. And we became friends. And we're beginning to build a relationship with him. He then moved on, I don't know what happened, but I believe that those investments, the giving in response to Jesus is actually an instrument of righteousness. And I'm calling it in to bring, his, to bring about God's purpose. We can very often, I know obviously we need to be wise, but sometimes we can look and just decide not to give where Jesus is actually saying give to the one who blesses you. And I find that quite a challenge. So giving and generosity is worship. We, we, we can worship God because we're being obedient to his word and we're depending on him for everything. So we worship God by returning our tithes as a first fruit. We worship God by sowing seeds, finances and heart and time and energy into other people and expecting a return. And we give generously to those that ask us. That's, our, that's my desire for us as Ash and I as a family. That's our desire as, for us as a church family. And I know that you guys are already practicing it really well. We, as we would say in North Carolina, you can tell my accent, I'm from North Carolina. We'd say, oh, y'all are doing a really good job with that. But let there be more. God wants to pour out blessing upon us. So thank you for sowing. Thank you for sowing of your time and your energies. Thank you for sowing your heart and your relationship. Thank you for sowing your finances. It's all worship to God. It's all something that God sees and loves to pour out his blessing upon you. I hope you're enjoying the new projectors. Finally, they came through. Thank you, Jesus. Those projectors cost $78,000. Wow, who knew? We didn't include that in the budget. So I'm thinking, okay, what church do we know that needs some projectors that we can sow a seed into? But maybe there's somebody here that you're saying, you know what, I wanna sow a seed. I, I need some blessing in my own life. I wanna sow a seed, and I'm gonna sow a seed to help pay for these projectors. No compulsion, please don't do it because I'm twisting your arm. If you do it, do it with great joy. But if you do it and you sow a seed, expect God to bless you because that's what his word says. Call it back. I want to invite you to stand, if you would, please. As I wrap up here, I just want to speak a blessing over us as a community. I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to just speak this as a blessing over you. So I bless you to understand the principle of sowing and reaping. That you wouldn't sow sparingly and therefore reap sparingly, but you would sow bountifully and therefore reap bountifully. I bless you as a church family to decide in your heart what you want to do, to be faithful to, as the Lord convicts you to be faithful to his word. And I bless you to not be reluctant, not be under compulsion, but to give out of the hysterical joy and hilarity in your hearts, the, the, the joy of the Lord in you. And I bless you that, that God would make his grace, may the Lord release grace upon you and make it overflow and abound to you. I bless you so that in that grace you would have everything that you need, all sufficiency, all of the time in everything that you do so that you may abound in every good work. I bless you to abound in good work and to not grow weary in doing good as the Bible says, but in due time recognize that you will reap a harvest. So I bless you to receive the seed from God to sow the seeds that He gives you. I bless, bless you to receive bread for food. I bless, bless you that you would, that the Lord would supply everything that you need and more and multiply your harvest and multiply your seed so that you can give more and receive a harvest of righteousness. I bless you to be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, to return your tithes as you, as you see fit, to sow seeds to give to those who ask. I bless you in Jesus' name. 
that in every way, your generosity, your obedience, and your dependence upon the Holy Spirit would result in praise and thanksgiving to God. And people would go, God is real, because He sees it through you, because we see it through your generosity. And of course, we're not just talking finances. I bless you with a heart to be generous to, with your time, with your energy, with your resources. Maybe you can't sow money, but maybe you can take someone out for lunch. Maybe you can't sow, take someone out for lunch, but you can have a coffee with somebody. Be generous in all that you do. I bless you in Jesus' name. Mel, back yeah. to you. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Murray. We would love to pray for you. So if you want prayer for anything, our ministry team, you can come up here to the front. Um, we we want to pray for you. So if you, you're not ready yet to just go running out the doors, if you want prayer for anything, healing, ministry for anything, freedom, breakthrough, deliverance, anything, our team are very equipped and would love to pray for you. But other than that, have an amazing week and we'll see you next Sunday. Be blessed.